This is a lecture for my second hour class on the third, uh, second of May, the second of May. Anyway, the Germans had 68 ships. Look at this. It has been bottled up here, you know, by British blockade. And so when the war is over, they are to turn their navy over to England. Uh, and they sailed out of the Baltic Sea and they went north of Scotland to that place called Scapa Flow. And the British didn't trust them. The British Navy was up there with their battleships and they had their guns aimed at these German ships that were coming in and the German ships were supposed to anchor and then the crews would get off and they would go over to these British ships and the British ships would take them back to Germany and meanwhile British crews would go over and take over the German ships. And just before this exchange took place, the uh, Germans just could not bring themselves to turn over their big, beautiful battleships to the British. And so they opened the valves on the ship and they sunk their own fleet. The British were absolutely horrified. They couldn't believe it. If you want to see the World War I fleet from Germany, uh, get yourself some scuba gear. And I don't know, you're going to go a long way down. It's in the North Atlantic Ocean, but that's where it is. It's sitting at the bottom of the North Atlantic. Rather than turn their navy over, they sunk it. So Germany is completely, almost completely disarmed, almost completely disarmed. Next, war reparations. Germany had to pay for the war. And of course, Germany's left holding the bag because the Austro-Hungarian Empire is now gone. The Ottoman Empire is now gone. And the Allies just total up their losses, you know, especially France. You know, this is how much land was destroyed. This is how many villages were destroyed. They just total it up. And what Germany had to pay back to the Allies was 132, it would be in the trillions today, but it was 132 billion gold Reichmarks. Today, the euro is in Europe, except for England. You have the euro all the way from Russia to the English Channel. But in those days, Germany had the Reichmark, and they had to pay 132 billion gold Reichmarks, and they paid it off. When did they finally finish paying off the debt from World War I? Remembering World War I is fought, ends in 1918, 1919. So when did they finally pay it off? 19... How much? 1935. Well, that's a long time. From 19... You're saying from 1919 to 1935? That's a long time. Do you want to revise your estimate or are you sticking with that? 1924. Well... That's reasonable. Any other guesses? Let's end this madness. The year 2000. That's when they finally paid it off. That's how crippling that debt was. And Germany's left holding the back. And right into that, get this down, Germany had to sign a piece of paper saying they started the war. Is that true? Did you? Who started it? You can argue that. You understand, 21,000 21, books have been written. Think about this. 21,000 books have been written on who started World War I. If I brought 10 historians in here and said, we've just got one question for you. We've been studying World War I. Tell us who started it. You'd get 10 different answers. The latest thing on World War I is by a British historian named Niall Ferguson. Great writer. If you want to read uh, British history, I re highly recommend him. I just read his book last summer. It's 800 pages long. It's really a magnificent book. And you know who he said started the war? He said England started the war. He said England used the excuse, we're going to go rescue Belgium. He said if England hadn't entered that war, it wouldn't have happened. That's his theory. Plenty of people will tell you, friends, I personally think it's Bosnia. Okay, I, that's who I think. But there's, there's Enough guilt to go around. Who's the only one in this whole thing? Which, well, who's the only country in this whole thing, when you talk about the start of the war, that participated in the war, that comes out with what they call in the court of law, clean hands? The United States. United States. That's exactly true. Everybody else is up for grabs. But you know what? The Germans had to sign a piece of paper saying we started that war. And that's just not true. There's, there's enough, right? There's an, everybody's got this ulterior motive. There's enough blame to go around. Also, get this down. The Treaty of Versailles created a new government for Germany. You notice I didn't say the Germans created a new government. I said the Treaty of Versailles did. What's the capital city of Germany? Berlin. Berlin. 
Okay. Berlin. And uh, the capital city, first of all, they're going to say, well, let's get this in order. Number one, the Treaty of Versailles says the Kaiser uh, is deposed. There is no more Kaiser. Kaiser Wilhelm. And you know what he did? <laughs> after he's kicked out, after he's no longer Kaiser, he moved to, didn't go far, he moved here to the Netherlands. And uh, in 19... Uh, 1940, he's still alive, living in the Chateau, and when the German army comes marching through in World War II, when Hitler's army now, it's Hitler's army, when they come through the Netherlands on their way to Paris, and they're going to conquer it, they're going to do it in six weeks, what the German army couldn't do it in four years, the Kaiser stood out in front of his house with a little German flag, and he waved it as the World War II Germans, the Nazis, a very different group of Germans, the Nazis, came marching by. So no more Kaiser. Number two, they moved the capital of Berlin. They said, or the capital of Germany. They said Berlin is no longer the capital city. <clears throat> now you're going to Weimar, okay? And they created a thing. The Allies do this. The German people don't do this. It's called the Weimar Republic. That's the new government. The Weimar Republic. They create a republic. And you know what a Republic is. Of course, governments enforced on people rarely, rarely, if ever, survive. The United States is the strongest republic that ever existed. There was a Spartan Republic, there was a Roman Republic, there's been a French Republic, but the United States Republic is the greatest republic that ever existed. Uh, and the strongest and the wealthiest republic that ever existed. And a good part of our success comes from the fact that nobody came in and said, all right, this is going to be your government. Who created this republic? 55 Americans. I never can remember, as long as I've been teaching this, I never can remember it's 55 or 56, but I think it's maybe 56. That was written by Americans. The United States created its own government. Rarely, when you try and impose a government, on people, does it work? Do we have a recent example of that, of a nation trying to impose a form of government on another nation? And it doesn't work, huh? Iran? <coughs> Iran? Is that what you said? Yeah. Maybe. I think you're right. Anything more? Iran's a little dated. Not far, but anything more recent than Iran? Yeah, what what do we do there? I just keep reminding you people who have been about to take over this country. What did we do there for 20 years? We tried to impose a democracy on them. For 10,000 years, they have been a tribal system and the tribal chieftain rules. But we said, <laughs> we're going to come in here, we're going to give you a much better form. Of, did the, Iran, did the uh, Afghani people say, please come in and give us a democracy? We don't know much about it. And you kind of are experts on it. Is that what happened? No. no, we went there and we said, we're going to make a democracy out of this place. We're going to reverse 10,000 years of history. And of course, you know, Americans are always in a hurry. We want everything done yesterday. And that served us pretty well. That served us pretty well. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But if you're going to reverse 10,000 years of history, uh, it's not going to be done overnight. And how did the, and, and we, so we established a democracy what we call the democracy. They had elections. They had a president. They had a parliament. And what happened the day we pulled out? It collapsed. If you want to go back a little further, Vietnam. We went to South Vietnam. It's going to be a democracy. Well, we spent 58,000 lives there and billions, which would be trillions of dollars today. We stayed there. Well, we were in Vietnam for 30 years. And we left in 1973. And what happened after 30 years of effort to create a democracy by the United States? What happened 24 months after we left? It collapsed like a house of cards. And today it's a communist dictatorship. Trying to impose governments from the outside where it worked. Again, the reason our republic is so strong, it came from us. It came from us. And so the Weimar Republic, get this down, is weak. It never really had the support of the German people. It never really had the support of the German people. 
and it should surprise no one that Hitler destroyed it in 1933. The Weimar Republic lasts from 1919, that's the year the Treaty of Versailles is signed, until 1933. Okay? So it didn't work. And then, of course, the last thing, get this down, Wilson knew this was a horrible treaty, but the last thing is, is that uh, they put, to, they felt like, they said, we've got to have the support of the United States. So wagging its crippled tail at the end of this 230, 230 pages, it's a book. Wagging its crippled tail at the end of this, what do they include to bring Wilson along? The League of Nations. The League of Nations. They throw that in. Well, the treaty was signed on June 28, 1919, in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, just outside of Paris. By the way, that was the fifth anniversary to the day that Archduke Ferdinand had been assassinated. And when the German delegates are brought in to sign the treaty, they're shocked. Well, of course, they were given a copy of the treaty in advance, but they're shocked by what the treaty said. They believed that the treaty, the final version of the treaty, would be more along the lines of Wilson's 14 points. Uh, but when they read the treaty, they discovered that it wasn't at all like the 14 points, that this was a very punitive treaty. By the way, Churchill read it. Winston Churchill read it, and he said, this will cause another war. Uh, punitive, that means to punish. Write that down. That's what this treaty was about, punishing Germany. And again, Germany's left holding the bag because all of its allies are demolished. And at first the Germans said, we won't sign it. Well, guess what? You know, here they are at Versailles, outside of Paris, but the troops are still in the trenches. The war can start again just like that. Nobody's gone home. The two armies are there. And that's what the Allies did. They said, if you don't sign this treaty, we will resume the war. Uh, and so the Germans signed it. But get this, they signed it only after they uh, only after they filed 400 let's think about this it's a 230 page treaty the germans filed 450 pages of objections to this treaty 450 pages but then they signed it and on the day this journey was in the hall of mirrors i've shown you that picture haven't i yeah well on the day woodrow wilson and the big four they're sitting up there at this table and that hall of mirrors is crammed everybody you couldn't have uh, grease some one other person and slid them in there. They're packed because they know they're seeing history unfold before their very eyes. And Wilson is sitting there, and the treaty is open like this. And the German delegate comes up, and Wilson's sitting there holding his pencil. And the German delegate looked right at Woodrow Wilson before he signed the treaty, and he said, "This in signing this document, I am signing my death warrant." End quote. And that just enraged Wilson. And what did Wilson do? Punch them. Huh? Yeah. Punch no, them. Wilson didn't do that when he you couldn't tell Wilson was angry, except what did he do? He broke his pencil. Okay, and everybody there knew he was enraged. And guess what? That German who signed it goes home, and a year after he signed it, an ex-German soldier who felt that the German army had been betrayed by the German government sees this man walking down the street and he shot him to death. Okay, the the, the German delegate that signed, signed the treaty, the treaty of, of Versailles, okay? And Hitler will ride that treaty, <laughs> I'll just say it one more time, pardon me, Hitler will ride that treaty, the treaty of Versailles, to power. Again, he didn't promise Germans that he would murder Jews. He didn't promise, he didn't say a word about the Jews. He didn't promise uh, Germans, he didn't say a word about the Jews so he's in power. He didn't say, I'll start the greatest war in history. He simply said, I'll get rid of this treaty. Uh, because this treaty is destroying Germany. And by the way, they elected him to do that, and and he did it. And then he goes on to start the greatest war in history, World War II, and murdered millions of Jews in the Holocaust. Well, so now Wilson, get this down, after six months in France, and you know, Wilson was never in very good health. Uh, he's not an old man, but he's not in very good, never was in his life in very good health. Kind of like Teddy Roosevelt, his arch nemesis. But Wilson was worn out. He'd been in France for six months fighting uh, with these European delegates. And now he had to bring the treaty home. And I want you to write this down. Now we're going to talk about the ratification battle, okay? The ratification. A president can sign any treaty he wants. He can give Wisconsin to Canada. He can sign a treaty saying that. But then whatever, whichever treaty the president 
signs. He has to bring it home and it has to be ratified. I'm not saying rad, my Oklahoma accent. I'm not saying rad. I'm saying rat, R-A-T, ratified by, and who rat, ratifies the Senate? Who ratifies the treaty? The Senate gave, gave it away there. Anyway, it's got, the House has nothing to do with this. The Constitution says the president signs the treaty. He's got to bring it back to the Senate and the Senate has to approve it or ratify the treaty. Uh, and what is the vote? How big of a vote does it take to approve a treaty? Two thirds. Two thirds. And so that's why you rarely ever see a president with a treaty. Well, get this down. Well, what's Wilson? You tell me. You already know. What's Wilson's problem in bringing this treaty back in 1919 to the Senate? He knows it's bad. What? He knows it's bad. I'm sorry. He knows it's bad. Well, he knows it's bad, but he's going to send it over there anyway. What? The Senate's majority Republicans. The Republicans control the Senate. Remember that in 1918. This is 1919, right? Remember that? The Republicans. And by the way, write this man down. There's the Senate majority leader. He's he's the leader of the majority, the Republicans in this case, Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts. By the way, that's Teddy Roosevelt's best friend. By the way, Teddy Roosevelt, it's 1919. Teddy Roosevelt just died. And that's Roosevelt's best friend. By the way, Woodrow Wilson had a PhD. He had a doctorate in what? Political science. What is that? Government. It's government. Yeah. So he knew. He knew how government, he knew the Constitution like the back of his hand. Guess what? This guy has a PhD in political science. So it's going to be Dr. Thomas Woodrow Wilson versus Dr. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, a progressive Democrat, versus Dr. Henry Cabot Lodge, a conservative uh, Republican, and Dr. Henry Cabot Lodge is going to win. Okay? Uh, Lodge, though, I want to be fair here. Lodge certainly was motivated by his dislike of Wilson. He didn't like him. And, but, but get this down. <clears throat> most Republicans, and again, I didn't say all, most Republicans had... I want you to put on your little thinking caps. Most Republicans were not just obstructionists. You hear that all the time. Well, I don't like her, so I'm not going to vote for anything she's for. Regardless if she has a good idea or a bad idea, I'm just not going to vote for her. That's a lot. Well, that's stupid. Um, <laughs> I guess we're all guilty of that one time. Or another, but, uh, that's stupid. Most Republicans, and that, that's obstructionist. When you're against something just to be against it, that's obstructionist. Uh, and a lot of times this story is told that the Republicans just hated Woodrow Wilson so bad they're just going to vote against him just to stick their thumb inside. That's not true. Now, there were some Republicans like that, but that's not true. Most Republicans weren't obstructions. Most Republicans, get this now, most Republicans said, we'll vote for the treaty, Mr. President, but not as it is. We want to amend the treaty. Get that down. We want to amend it. There are some things we want to change in the treaty. We want to amend it. And what was the main thing they wanted to amend? What was the main problem the Republicans had with this treaty? Think about what you know about the treaty of Versailles. What's the main problem that the Republicans had with it? If the United States joins the League of Nations, they'll get involved in another war. What? It'll, they'll get involved in another war. Well, explain yourself. I think you're in the ballpark. Like, if something like happened. Pick a couple of countries. Be more specific. If Germany, Germany started another war. goes to war against France, France the US would get involved. and we're in the League of Nations, we have to go fight. Excellent. Very good. <clears throat> what does the Constitution say about the United States going to war? How's that work? What happens? What happened when the Germans sunk four American ships in March of 1917? Wilson did what? He went to the Congress and says this. The president has to ask the Congress because only Congress can declare war, right? We haven't done that in 80 years, uh, but uh, yeah, only Congress can declare war. 
Only Congress, can, if American boys and girls are going to die in a war, only Congress can declare war. Now, the president is commander in chief and he can send troops into action. That's a fact, too. But so far as a war, the, pre the Congress has to declare war. If we join the League of Nations, who's going to be declaring war for American boys? Two other countries. Have Which countries? The if we join the League, who's going to take over? According to the Republicans, who's going to take over Americans' Americans' war making power? If we join the League, the other nations. Well, which other what, what what do they call those other nations together? The league. Okay, write that down. If you with me, that's what you said, isn't it? <coughs> if you all with me, if we join the League of Nations and the League of Nations, yo, we've got to go to war. And the Republicans, and I mean, you know, you may disagree with their argument, but it's not just obstructionism. I think that's a legitimate point. And the Republicans say, hey, we just want to change it. We want to change it, Mr. President, to say that only the U.S. Congress, get this down, only the U.S. Congress can commit American soldiers to war. We'll be in the league. We'll support the league, but only the Congress can send United States soldiers into war, into war. And the Republicans thought they were being a pretty legitimate. Now, there's a group of Republicans, and you don't even have to note this. There are a group of Republicans, and they are called the Irreconcilables, and they announced even before the treaty had been signed while Wilson was negotiating, we'll never vote for any treaty brought here by Woodrow Wilson. You've always got that little block on both sides in the Congress. But most Republicans said, Mr. President, we'll give you 80% of what you want. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> we'll give you 80% of what you want. We just want to amend the treaty. We don't want to vote it down. Uh, but, of course, to get this down as well, Republicans knew, get this down, America, Republicans knew that, um, that uh, in, in the United States, uh, the tide, so to speak, was turning, okay? They knew that the war, get this down, this is what I'm going to say to you, they knew that the attitude of Americans was changing. You know, the progressive era, you know, Woodrow Wilson saved the world, make the world safe for democracy was being replaced after World War I, get this down, by isolationism. Uh, world War I turns out to be a very unpopular war, even though we quote won, where we're on the winning side. It turns out to be a very unpopular war. And when it's over and the troops come home, the American people have this attitude, enough world saving. We've had it. And we fought the war. Now it's time to bring the troops home and don't get involved in any more foreign wars. Isolationism, get this down, isolationism by 1919. You know, the American people, many of them start to feel uh, we, were, we were tricked into this war. The British and the French tricked us into this war. Isolationism uh, is, is versus internationalism. Internationalism is the idea that this country should be involved all over the world. We're internationalists today. Thank you, Woodrow Wilson and others, but we're internationalists today, making the world safe for democracy. But a lot of people start saying, okay, we did our duty. It's time to come home and no more foreign wars. The progressive era, get this down, was coming to an end. You know, progressivism had been around uh, since uh, 1900. But now, by 1920, World War I killed the progressive idea. You know, the progressives are, let's, so let's save the world. And World War I killed that. And conservatism was taking its place. In fact, get this down, the election of 1920 is an election year. And in 1920, beginning in 1920, the country's going to elect three conservative Republicans in a row. And that's not exactly true, but that'll work for this morning. I'll explain it further. But three Republicans in a row. The 1920s is a conservative Republican decade. Well, Lodge could sense that America was changing. Uh, he could sense that time was on the side of the Republicans. Uh, he knew that if the Republicans would just stall a little bit, 
that they could pretty well write whatever kind of treaty they wanted. So the first thing he did is he got up on the floor of the Senate with that treaty, 230 pages long, and he read the whole thing to the Senate. And of course, he was a PhD professor teacher, and as he read, he would stop and he would make various comments about certain articles in the treaty. He drug it out as long as he could. Woodrow Wilson's over in the White House, and he sees what the Republicans are doing. They're stalling. They're waiting for the country to complete this shift from liberalism to conservatism. And so Wilson says, to heck with that. I, you know, I'm tired of dealing with these politicians. I'm going to go over the head of these politicians to directly to what? The people. The people. That's exactly true. And what's that called? He's going to use a tactic of his arch political enemy, T.R., when you go directly to take your case directly from people, what's that called? The bully pulpit. Remember that? Wilson says, I'm going to use the bully pulpit. So get this down. And like I say, now remember, Wilson's worn out from six months of negotiations. And you ever go on a two week vacation and get home and you're so happy to be home, you're so happy to fall on the couch and say things? Well, he'd been gone for six months. And like I say, he was never in good health. But he gets on a train. That's how presidents traveled in those days. And he traveled 8,000 miles by a train. And he gave 40 major speeches, several a day, saying that this treaty had to be passed. Uh, and he refused to get this down. You know Woodrow Wilson's stubborn nature. He refused to compromise with the Republicans. He said again and again in these speeches, this treaty must be passed as it is. If they change one comma in that treaty, he said, then your sons died for nothing if they changed one comma in that treaty. He actually called, and he, he said this about the treaty. He said, he said, if we if we don't pass this treaty, even though we, quote, won the war, we will lose the peace. He called the treaty, this is a direct quote, the work of the hand of God. And I have no doubt that Woodrow Wilson saw himself it's God's instrument to save the world. Well, at Pueblo, Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado, on September 25th, 1919, he was speaking. And there were a group of gold star mothers sitting right down in front of the platform where Wilson was speaking. What are gold star mothers? What's the gold star? If you see a gold star hanging in somebody's window during time of war, what does that mean? Yeah, what? They have a family member um, fighting the war. Well, that's a blue star. If you see a blue star, that means, well, somebody in our family's fighting in this war. But what's a gold star? Somebody died. They were killed in action. That's exactly true. So here were a group of mothers who had lost sons. Uh, and Wilson, of course, had sent their sons to the war. And, and, and it was a very emotional moment. And Wilson was speaking to him. And during this speech, he became so overwrought that he broke down and wept. Now, I know we live in the age where, you know, crying your eyes out. In fact, I think we're all going to get on Interstate 40 one day. We're going to line up all the way from San Diego to Wilmington, North Carolina, and all hold hands and have a good cry. And then we're going to, all 330 million of us, and then we're going to blow our noses and go home, you know, crying today, cry, show your emotions and all that. Well, that may be the best thing since sliced bread. I don't think it is. But anyway, when a man cried, especially a man cried in uh, 1919, in public, in public, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. I was raised by the World War II generation. They didn't cry in public either. You know why? Because the 1919 generation raised that. But anyway, when Wilson cried, that was huge, okay? When he broke down and wept in public. We don't like our presidents to cry anyway under any circumstances. They're supposed to be just tough as steel. Whatever comes, we can all cry, but whatever comes, they can just see it through. That's our, that's our attitude, generally speaking. But he broke down and wept in public. And then he got back on his train, uh, and he headed across the state plains of Colorado. And uh, he complained of a headache. And they called the presidential physician up to his train car, and the presidential physician uh, examined him. And uh, finally, they stopped the train, and Wilson wanted to just get out out in the middle of nowhere and just walk up and down the tracks, just get some fresh air. And so he had to take a couple of Secret Service men with him, and he's walking up and down the tracks. But the whole time, 
He's rubbing his left arm. What was happening to Wilson? He was having a stroke. Okay, write that down. He was having a stroke. And so he walks a little bit and they put him back on the train. And he does have a stroke. It's not a major stroke, but he has a stroke. And they canceled the speaking tour immediately, cleared all the tracks between Colorado and Washington, D.C., and the presidential train roared back to Washington. And while this is going on, while Wilson has had this stroke over in the Congress, over in the Senate, they are debating uh, the Treaty of Versailles. At the very moment that the Democrats needed the leadership of their president, the president is incapacitated, to put it mildly. So anyway, as doctors come in the White House and they say, forget politics, forget the Treaty of Versailles, go to bed. Absolute, okay, well, Marshall, please come to the office. absolute bed rest. Absolute bed rest. And so that's what he did. And Miss, Mrs. Wilson, the second Mrs. Wilson, forced him to stay in the bed. And he seemed to be approving. And one morning, she's sitting on the side of the bed, I guess, combing her hair, getting ready to get dressed. The president is in the presidential bathroom preparing to shave, and all of a sudden she heard a thud, absolute dead weight. Not just someone falling, absolute dead weight. And she jumped to her feet, and when uh, she and other people got into the bathroom, the president was lying there unconscious. His entire left side is paralyzed. He will never have use of his arm again. Uh, he will finish most of his, he's got about uh, a year left. He'll finish his last year in the White House in a wheelchair. Uh, he completely lost his speech. Uh, for a while, he was blind. Okay, for a while, he was blind. Um, and uh, uh, the Democrat Party, essentially, they've lost their leader um, at the time that they are debating this treaty. Well, Wilson eventually will recover. Just a second. Wilson will eventually recover uh, enough to sit up in bed. The Congress considered, you know, if a president becomes incapacitated, the Constitution says that he can be removed from office. Uh, and then the vice president, take it. and the Congress considered that. They all came over and visited him. And he sat up in the bed, you know, in a fresh pair of pajamas with shade. And, he squeezed the ball in his right hand for several days so he could have this firm grip. You know, when Henry Cabot Lodge, the Republican, came up to see him. Um, and they talked to him and they said, Mr. President, if we will just compromise on this one thing, by the way, write this down, reservation number 10. You could call that amendment number 10, reservation. You know, this is what the, Re the Republicans say, we want to change this. They said, Mr. President, if you'll just give the Republicans reservation number 10, which says only the Congress can send U.S. troops to war, they'll vote for your treaty and it'll pass. And of course, you've got to remember what I told you about Wilson, how stubborn he was and how he believed he was always right. And Wilson said, never, <coughs> never. He said, I am telling the Democrat Party to vote against this treaty if the Republicans change one thing in it. Uh, well, the Republicans actually, got this down, managed to amend the treaty. They, they put their amendments in, and when they put their amendments in, it went before the Senate. And this is a pretty odd situation. Every Democrat, on orders of Wilson, get this down, every Democrat voted against Wilson's treaty with these amendments, and every Republican voted for it. But there wasn't enough to, uh, well, I say every Republican, that's probably not true. But anyway, the majority of Republicans voted for it. Uh, but they failed to get the two-thirds votes needed to pass. The United States never joined the League of Nations. That was Wilson's baby. The United States never joined the League. We never approved the Treaty of Versailles. In fact, get this down, we had to sign a separate peace treaty with Germany in 1921. So technically, the war for us lasted until 1921. Woodrow Wilson left the White House predicting that history would vindicate him. He said, history will prove that I was right. Uh, and uh, he left the White House in 1921. 36 months later, in 1924, he was dead. He was dead 36 months after leaving the White House. Well, when we come back tomorrow, we'll take it up there.